If you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and go to Luke chapter 5? We are going to conclude a series titled A Seat at the Table. I pray this has been beneficial for you and eye-opening for you. As God has invited you to sit at his table, we're to do the same. And we've looked at a, a couple things. You know, you think about the Gospel of Luke, and there's so many stories in the Gospels that are centered around eating, because much of our lives are centered around eating. And there's 10 accounts, or there's 10 stories in the Gospel of Luke, five that are unique to Luke, and we've talked about the, the one where Jesus showed up at the house of the Pharisee, and there was the, the woman who was known for her sin that showed up. Last week, my dad did a great job of talking about one of the greatest stories in the Bible, the, the prodigal son. There's an invitation to the celebration, no matter how far you are from God, there's always, a, there's always a chance back. And when you come back to him, his arms are open wide to receive you and to accept you and to love you. But both of those stories have what maybe we would call the antagonist, the, the opposite view. As, as many are celebrating those who are returning, there are some who are skeptics, like Simon the Pharisee, when the woman who was known for sin showed up, he said, I can't believe Jesus would associate himself with a sinner like that. Or when the prodigal son returns, you had the older brother that, that said, that's not fair. Why does he get to spend all the money and come back and then be celebrated? And meanwhile, I'm over here doing my own thing and I don't, I don't get celebrated. And all these stories are unveiling to us the heart of God, that he, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he's willing to do whatever it takes to go after that lost soul, to bring them back home, to bring them back to completion. And he celebrates that. And in fact, that's the assignment that he's given us, church is to do the same, to go after those who are far from him, those who are headed to death and bringing them to life. That's what he's called us to do. And so we, we see the heart of God and we're gonna see it again here in Luke chapter five. If you have your Bibles, if you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. Verse 27, it says, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. Now Levi's name is Matthew. It's, we know Matthew is one of the disciples. So for familiarity's sake, so I'm gonna just refer to Levi as Matthew. So Jesus goes out and he sees a tax collector by the name of Matthew sitting at his tax booth. And he says, follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, he left everything and he followed him. And then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, and they said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered. He said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's pray one more time. Father, would you use this story to speak to us, to challenge us, as we are always being shaped and molded to be more like you, to be image bearers, to be Christ followers, to be worshipers of God, would you make us more like you through your scripture, your word. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. 2020, anybody remember that year? 2020. Um, let me ask you a question. How many of you enjoy going out to eat at restaurants? You, you love it. It's just way easier than having to cook at home. In fact, that's the only reason why I want to have a lot of money is so I can just eat out every single night. And it's not because my wife is not a great cook. She's a phenomenal cook. It's just I don't want to have to clean up after myself. So I'd love going to restaurants. In 2020, um, you know, when COVID hit and then restaurants started to open up, if you're not from Florida, um, we, we didn't really close too long. So we were open pretty soon. Uh, thank God for that. But we would show up to a restaurant. We would sit down at a restaurant and uh, we would get ready to eat. But something looked a little bit different. There was something different about showing up to restaurants. And it wasn't just people wearing masks. The, the food was still served, but there was something different. I'm gonna ask the, the team to come out and help me. There was something different about the tables that we sat at and the restaurants that we went to. When you walked in, you saw something that you've never seen before. And that was a piece of plexiglass. And um, thank you, Danny. <laughs> Right, you're, you're a little too close to me, all right? Listen, I want to get what you have. Um, so, so this is what you saw when you showed up to a, a restaurant. Man, dude, going for it. Let's go. Look at that. Man, I don't care how great of a worship leader you are. You are a greater servant, Danny. Come on. That's it. Uh, so you showed up to these, these restaurants, and you had these plexiglass things in the way. 
And restaurants were meant to bring people together. They were meant to have great conversations and over great food. But then you had these things that separated us from the people that we would see. And we couldn't talk to them. There wasn't really any communication. And again, maybe the tables that you set at restaurants didn't, didn't split you and your party up. But for the most part, you get what I'm saying. In fact, we see these now a lot still, maybe not in restaurants, but when you order things at places like Chipotle or you go to, and I'm always like, hello, can you hear me? Like, this is still, this is not, this is not working well. Can I tell you that um, this is how so much of the church and our mentality has become? And we're going to see this in this passage in Luke chapter 5 about what Jesus is talking about. And I'm going to give you the point here, and you can write this down if you're taking down notes. Jesus has called us to build tables of connection and not walls of separation. If you look at Luke 5, you're going to see there's a, there's a lot going on. It's, it's like the start of the ministry of Jesus. He sees a couple guys fishing, and what does he do? He says, drop the poles and follow me. And so we start to see the early disciples take place. You see Peter. You see his brother Andrew. Then you got James, and you got John, and they're all following Jesus. Then shortly, Philip comes by, and he brings Nathaniel. So they start following Jesus, and he starts to perform these miracles, water into wine. He's healing people. You even have a, the story of the, the demoniac who's got all the demons in him, and Jesus casts them out to the pigs. You remember that, that story? And so all these people are, are following Jesus and watching these things. And it kind of ends at this, this house where Jesus is teaching, and these friends want uh, Jesus to heal their paralytic friend, and so they, they can't get to him. And so the, what, what do they do? They get onto the roof. They, they create a hole in the roof, and they drop him. You remember that story? They drop him down, and Jesus heals him. He says, you know, you're healed. Get up take your mat and go home. And so all these people are watching this, this early ministry of Jesus. You have people from all villages of Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea. But you don't just have people, you also have Pharisees watching Jesus. You have the teachers of the law who are standing off to the side, um, wondering, thinking, is this ministry, is this, this new Jesus thing, is this, is this aligning with what we're trying to do? And so, so that's, what we're, that's what's happening. And then in verse 27, it says, after this, Go back to verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth, or Matthew, and he says, follow me. And Jesus said to him, uh, follow me. And Levi gets up, he leaves everything behind, and he follows him. Now, Matthew's an interesting choice for a disciple because Jesus is looking at people who are fishing and he says, follow me, and you know they can do that. But he goes to Matthew, a tax collector. Can I just tell you, um, tax collectors were not welcomed people. They were despised people. They were traitors. They were extortioners. Nobody really liked them. In fact, to be a tax collector, to put taxes on people, uh, you had to, to bid, and you were picked if you were the highest bidder to then tax people on what was coming in and what was going out. Now, the worst part was is that these tax collectors were often Jewish men. And so they were traitors to the Jewish people. They were taking taxes, taking money from the Jewish people, and then giving them to the Roman Empire. So it wasn't like they were collecting taxes for the nation of Israel. There was no nation of Israel. They were just Israelites under Roman Empire rule. And so these Jewish people were taking taxes from their own people, and then they were giving it to the, to the Romans. They were cheating their own people. In fact, Jewish law would say, it, it'd be okay for you to cheat on your taxes. Somebody said amen. Amen. It'd be okay for you to cheat on your taxes and not give them to the, to the Jewish people, to the Roman people. It'd be okay. Because a tax collector, at least to a Pharisee, to the law, you might as well have been a murderer. You, you might as well have been a, been a liar. You might as well have been a robber. Tax collectors were despised by their own people because they were Jewish people stealing. What is Jesus doing talking to a tax collector Going, him, going to him, Matthew, and saying, Matthew, I want you to get up. I want you to leave everything, and I want you to follow me. Now, if I'm Jesus, and I want you to imagine the conversation that's taking place perhaps around a table with his disciples. Jesus shows up, and he says, guys, I got a new recruit. And the disciples are thinking, great, who do you have for us? And Jesus goes on, you know how, you know how people don't like tax collectors? 
And they're like, yeah. You know how like we, we hate them and we don't like them and they're traitors? Yeah? What are we going to do to them? Jesus and Jesus is like, no, we're not going to do anything to them. We've actually added them to our team. And, and, and I found one. And his name's Matthew. Now, wait a minute. Jesus, you know that these tax collectors are cheating us of our money. They're robbing us. They're taking more than they should. In fact, the fishers who are collecting fish and catching fish are being taxed off that fish more than they should be. And so they're clearly, they've got to be upset. And we don't read that. I'm just kind of looking into the lines a little bit. For those who've watched the Chosen series, you can kind of see this. But um, we really don't want people who are tax collectors who are considered sinners, Jesus, to be part of our, our, of our team. But what Jesus is really trying to get them to understand is, and maybe what he had to convince them of, is to say, listen, disciples, Matthew has really changed. There's been a clear change of heart because this man once was a sinner. This man once was despised. But just like you were invited to this table, so is this man. He's really been changed. Now, isn't that a question that we ask a lot? How do we really know if somebody is really saved? You ever wonder that? Some of you this Thanksgiving, you were sitting around some of your family, and they've been professing Christ for 30-something years by the way they talk, by what they've been doing and what they've been drinking. You're starting to question whether or not they really are saved. How do you really know if somebody's saved? Now, I'm not going to answer necessarily that entire question, but what I want to look at is two things that we see in Matthew's life, two big differences that, are, that, that, that would tell us that Matthew has experienced true change, and the first is that he gave up everything. He gave up everything. Now, Matthew was not some fisher man who gave up his pole to follow Jesus. You know, I don't think that took a lot of convincing. You know, I've, I've got this fishing pole. Um, you know, do, do I have, that's, that's a big thing. Do I have to give up? Just give up the pole, you know. But, but Matthew is a tax collector. This man has a lot of wealth. This man has homes. This man has status. If you ever wondered if the disciples ever argued, well, the answer is yes. They often argued about which was the greatest. I think they would argue about who gave up the most. And there's no debate here. Matthew has given up the most to follow Jesus. Matthew gets added to the group of disciples, but I want you to notice that he gives up everything that he has. In regards to sacrifice, this is huge. Jesus would go on later in Luke chapter 14 to talk about what it meant to be a disciple. Not just what it looked like, but what it would cost you. Have you ever had to wonder what it would look like for you to step into a relationship with Jesus, what it would cost you? Like we, we weigh the pros and the cons, all right? What's the good things about coming to church and being a believer? What's the, what's the negative side of things? And we, we know people like this. They keep asking the questions. Well, what do I have to give up? What do I have to leave behind? What do I have to abstain from to follow Christ? And I'm like, it's no longer you have to abstain from these things. It now becomes I get to abstain from these things because I don't want to be a part of those things anymore because everything about me has changed. And so what does Matthew leave behind? He leaves everything behind. In Luke 14, verse 33, Jesus would say some radical things about being a a disciple and what it would cost you. He would say things like, you'd have to hate your father, hate your mother, hate your spouse, hate your children, hate your brother, hate your sister, even your own life. This is what he says in verse 33 of Luke 14. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, give up everything, and I've got some welfare program here over here that you can be part of, that I'll take care of you. I'll give you when you need things. He's saying, I will give you the only thing that you need, and that is assurance of salvation. I will give you the free gift of eternal life. And that is the only thing that you need. And now everything that you once were, everything that you once did, every, every place that you once used to go to, you now agree to the terms, you count the cost, that that is no longer who I am. I'm no longer that person anymore. I'm no longer that individual anymore. I no longer say the things that I used to say. In fact, my way no longer works. Can anybody attest to that? Your way was just not working. You tried and you tried and you tried. You tried to figure it out. You tried to weigh the options. You tried some of the the pros and the cons, and you just realized that there was nothing that you could do, nothing you could do right if you consistently continued in your way. And so agreeing to the terms, counting the cost, is to say, you know what? My way is not working. There is a better way of living, and that way is God's way. It's 
It's not my way, it's Yahweh. And can I be honest, I think we have a lot of people who love this idea of escaping from hell and, and spending eternity in heaven, but they have not given up their old ways. They're still walking in their old ways. They, they think that they've repented of their sins and that they can continue to do the same things that they once did. Man, I could be a Christian and still be a drunk. I could be a Christian and still be sleeping around. I could be a Christian and it goes on and it goes on. And, and here's, here's what we've done, church. We've told you that repentance is something that you say and it's not something that you do. But I don't know about you, the Bible's very clear. Repentance is not just something you say, but repentance is something that you do. There's got to be some type of transformation in your life from who you were to now who you are in Christ. Matthew, I was a tax collector. I cheated on the, the, the people that I was dealing with, but now I'm no longer that. In fact, I'll give up everything because now I am following Jesus. Who I once was is not working anymore. It's not, it's not what God is wanting me, so now I step into what God is wanting me to do, and it's just so much better. Can anybody tell us, it is just so much better following God's way than your way? Your way wasn't working, God's way is. And this is what Matthew would begin to discover. And we see a 180, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. So we see this in Matthew's life. There's clearly a, a turnaround, an, an event, a turnaround in his life, and he follows Jesus. But there's something else that we understand and we realize is that he doesn't just give up everything, but he tells everybody. He tells everyone. It's like when, when you discover something, you immediately want to tell somebody about it. When you watch some show, I don't know, I'm getting older now, so all I do is watch documentaries. Anybody there, you just watch documentaries all the time, and I'm like, you got to watch this documentary. It's called Sea Spiracy, and it's all about these, these, these whales and all about the fish and how we're eating. I don't know if anybody see that one, and I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm becoming a fish advocate. I'm like, we can't eat that, that tuna can because they've killed dolphins while they caught that. I'm, I'm just like, you got to know about this stuff. I didn't know about this, whether all of it's true or not. That's why it's called the Sea Spiracy. But I'm, I'm watching these things. I'm watching these documentaries, and I just I want to tell people about it because I'm, my eyes are being opened. There's this enlightenment that's been happening in my heart, and I'm like, everybody has got to know. Whether it's a pair of shoes you buy, whether it's a new dress you buy, whether it's this new toothpaste that's going to make your teeth whiter than anything, you just got to tell people because you want them to know. And this is what we see in Matthew's life. Go to verse 29 of Luke chapter 5. It says he gave up everything and he followed him. And then Levi held a great, what's it say? A great banquet. Maybe your translation says feast. Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. So he throws this banquet. He sets up the table. Now, who's invited to Matthew's table? Is it the respected in society? Is it the, uh, the single moms? Um, is it the mothers who take their kids to the park? Is it those who are great athletes? Um, no, it's not, because he didn't have friends like that. Who's invited to his table? The people that he knows. Who does he know? Other tax collectors, who would be known and classified as sinners who would be considered like murderers and robbers. Those are the only people he knows. And so who does he invite? Those people. I think sometimes this idea that we have to go out and invite some strange man to church or woman to church, it's just like invite the people that you know that you know aren't going to church. It's like, no, I gotta go, I gotta, I gotta go to the deepest depths. And sure, maybe you are called to that. But you, you go to the deepest depths to share your faith. Meanwhile, your neighbor over here has no idea about Christ, and you've forgotten about how to be a good neighbor and share your faith with your neighbor. So who does Matthew start with? He starts with the people that he knows. He invites those who he knows in his circle. He brings them to the table. Um, he, he doesn't put up any plexiglass because uh, he, he's like, hey, my, 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 my saint friend Jesus is showing up, so um, you know, put on your best behavior. No, he just says, show up, because I've invited this man. I've invited this man, Jesus. He's happy about what's taking place. You remember the rich young ruler when Jesus said, sell everything and give to the poor? He didn't. He walked away discouraged. Matthew wasn't discouraged when he gave up everything. Upset people don't throw parties, do they? Upset people can cry at their own parties. Because it's their own party. You can cry if you want to. But upset people don't throw parties. Matthew's throwing a party not because he's upset. 
Matthew's throwing a party because he can't believe that the change that's taken place in his life, and Matthew thinks, if God can save somebody like me, then he could save anybody. And so come on over. I'm, I'm laying out the feast. I've got all the food. I've got all the drinks. And I'm inviting Jesus to sit at the table with us. So what do we see with Matthew? He gives up everything. And he invites people. He tells them. He's like, I, I, I want you to know the change that's taking place in my life. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you've experienced a lot of change in your life when you came to know Jesus. When I was eight years old, I sat at a table and I read my Bible it wasn't this Bible, it was one with cartoons on it. Eight years old, and I'm sitting here thinking, like, I need this. This is something that has to be different in my life, and I need Jesus. And I got saved at a young age. And so I can't really say when I got saved, like, man, I left all the, the lying and sleeping around at eight years old. I left all that behind. You know, I left all the drinking behind at eight years old. But as I discovered who, who I was in Christ, I would learn the things that I shouldn't do. And if I ever d- dabbled in them, then I realized that there was a spirit within me that showed me guilt. And let's be honest, sometimes I'm thankful for, for that guilt. If I didn't have that guilt, I'd, I'd be a little upset. So I was thankful for that. And so I learned what it was um, to, to live for God. And I, and I learned here and there what it was to not live for God. But some of you realize that changed immediately. It's like when I stepped into the places I used to step in, man, I was miserable. I just felt it. When I drank the same things that I was drinking, I was, when I smoked the same things, when I slept around the same ways, I just, I just felt that something needed to be different in my life. And because God has saved me, I need others to experience that same change. And this is why when people come out of uh, uh, you know, human sex trafficking, they go right back in to pull those people out. People who are drug addicts go right back in. What do they do? To pull those people out. People who are alcoholics go right back in to pull those people out. People who are hurt and wounded and, and have parent issues, they go right back to help those people because that's their people. They can understand those people. They knew where they were, and they don't want anybody else to stay there. And so they... They pull those people. This is what Matthew's doing. He, he realizes that his circle is a bunch of sinners, tax collectors, and if God could save somebody like me, then God could save anybody. I don't want to talk like I used to talk. I don't want them to think like they used to think. I don't want them to walk like they used to walk. And I don't, and here's, the, here's what Matthew understands. I don't want to go to heaven alone. I don't want to be the only one in my neighborhood that's going to enter into the gates of heaven. I don't want to be the only one in my family. I thank God that I'm not the only one in my family. In fact, I can say confidently that everyone in my family will one day enter into the gates of heaven. But can you say that about yours? Can you say that about your community? Can you say that about your job? Can you with confidence say that? Matthew says, I do not want to go to heaven alone. Let me share a passage in Psalm 34. I love this. Psalm 34. This should be on the screen. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify. Somebody say magnify. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are what? Radiant. And their faces are what? Shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him, and he saved him out of all of his troubles. There's, there's new life taking place. And when there's new life taking place within you, some of you remember what it was like, and you wanted every single person to know. But now I want to turn the page a little bit, because until we can um, all be like Matthew, until we can all be a, a supporting cast that's all about life change, there are, there's often that attitude, that critical spirit within us, that this is, more, this is more appealing to our faith, this is more appealing to our church, this, this, this I like a lot more because uh, it separates me from everything else that I don't want to be a part of anymore. And so this is the story, right? Levi, look at verse 29. It says, Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of Tax collectors and others were eating with him. This, again, just shows you the magnitude of probably his wealth, being able to host a large crowd, putting out a feast. It says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, 
It's interesting that these tax collectors aren't asking Jesus this question directly. As often we see the enemy didn't want to confront you, they're going to want to confront somebody else. And, and so if you remember in the story of the paralytic, they're thinking something out loud and Jesus hears it. You go back to Luke 7 with Simon the Pharisee, he's thinking something to himself and Jesus hears it. And now they don't want to ask Jesus this question. They haven't asked him a question up until this point. They ask his disciples, um, excuse me, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, the other ones that were there. Um, your, your, your rabbi over here, this man, Jesus, uh, th- this doesn't look right. This doesn't fit our traditional way of religion. There's got to be some separation with you and those sinners. There, ha- there has to be. It's the law. This, this cannot be happening. Why is, why is your rabbi, the person you follow, your teacher, why is he sitting and why is he dining with these sinners? Why has there not been a wall erected for separation? Why is he sitting at a table? And that's the thing with the Pharisees is, is they, they don't see, and this is, this is the spirit that we have at times, we don't see like Jesus sees. And until we see like Jesus sees, we will have a heart that Jesus does not have. Until I can see the way he sees, I I will have a heart that he does not have. So God, help me see like you see. Help me know like you know, so I can care like you care. Because clearly Jesus knows something that these Pharisees do not know. And what he knows is that he has not come here for those who are not sick but he's come here for those who are sick. This is what he says. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Look around you. You know, why am I here? There are sick people. There are people dying. Who needs help? Is it it you? You've got everything figured out. You know this like the back of your hand. You can recite much of this. Is it you that I need to be here for? Do I need to be sitting with you every single day? What about the person over here who's broken? In fact, remember the story of the Good Samaritan? If Jesus was going back to that, he could say, there was somebody who was in need, and what did you do? The priest, the Levite, well, they just walked right past them. They didn't need to step into these affairs. Again, what's he saying? That there were walls of separation between you and anybody that was in need, between the person who was saved and the person that was lost. And Jesus is like, we have, to break, we have to break this barrier. We can't continue living like this. And so that is why I am here. There's this attitude of the Pharisees that says, um, I, can, I can only commune with, I can only dwell with, I can only talk with those who are well, and anybody who's sick, um, I, we, don't, we don't talk to them, we don't even welcome them, we don't, we don't associate ourselves with them. And Jesus is like, I've got a table, come sit, here you are. I pull out a seat for you. I pull out a seat for your friends. I pull out a seat for your family. I don't care how far they are. Bring them to me, and I'll sit with them. You know, I didn't discover this until I had kids. When I went to the doctor's office, you know, there are checkups that you have at the doctor's office and when you just need a checkup. But then there are times you go to the doctor's office when you're sick and you need to go to the doctor. But when you take your kids to the pediatrician, I didn't realize this until I started taking them to the pediatrician, that there was a well side, and then on the other side of the room, on the dark side, there was a sick side, right? I didn't know this. There's a sick side where you sit and wait if you're sick, and there's a well side that you sit and wait if you're well. And so I gotta take my kids when they're sick, you know, snot's coming out of their nose. I've gotta take them, I've gotta pass the well side, all these people who are there's, there's laughter over there, there's parents talking, there's cartoons playing, there's toys all on the floor, there's color. I gotta take my kids past that and walk over here to the sixth side where there, there's no music, there's no laughter, there's things oozing out of every hole in every kid's body, including my kid, and I'm sitting here thinking I'm going to die in this, this room. Why are they putting me in this room? But, but that's the reality. When you have a sick visit, they're going to put you over here with the sick people. Now, could you imagine if in South Florida, all the pediatrician places stopped doing any type of sick visits, only did well visits? Only check-ins. Could you imagine what that would do to the health of our next generation, next month? Could could you imagine what it would look like a year from now? If they completely stopped seeing well patients or sick patients, they only saw well patients. 
If you walked in, there wasn't any sick room. You weren't even allowed in the building because you were sick and we didn't want to associate ourselves with you. And we certainly don't want you getting whatever you have onto everybody else. What I've learned as a parent, it doesn't really matter what your kid has, you're gonna get it. Especially if you got three kids. You're gonna get it at some point, your wife's gonna get it. And you may think it's been two weeks and you're spared. You're not spared. <laughs> you're gonna, it's, gonna get, it's gonna get to you. Could you just imagine if all the hospitals and the doctor's office just said, hey, you know what, we're no longer taking sick patients. We're only taking well patients. And that's the attitude here that we see from the Pharisees. I don't associate, we don't associate ourselves with those who are sick, but those who are hurting. We associate ourselves with those who are well, well well-informed, well taken care of. They know the Bible, they show up to synagogue, they offer their sacrifices at the temple. That's who we associate ourselves with. And you know, we're reading this today and we're thinking (laughs) that what kind of attitude is that? And then we take a deep, long look into ourselves, even the church, and we realize that at times, that's the same attitude as the church. That's the same attitude as me. That's the same attitude as my family. Had new neighbors move in, we'll never talk to them. We will never invite them over to our house. You see what they, what they do, the music they listen to? Do You see the people outside trying to get into the doors of the church? No way we're letting them into this church. No way. We don't associate ourselves with people like that. We, we, we associate ourselves with people like that by putting a piece of plexiglass between us and between them. And, and as nice as this looks, what does this create? It creates separation. And how am I supposed to share my faith with people who don't know God if I've created a wall that's separating me from the people that don't know God? No, Jacob, you just got to pray for them. Just pray. Is that what Jesus said? Stay in your church and pray for the people, hoping that they will come and draw near to me. No, what did he say? He didn't say stay. He said, go. Go? Yeah, but, but Jesus, I can't go into some of these places. Jesus wasn't like at a strip club eating with Matthew and his friends. He was at his house. I, I get there are some places that maybe we should not go to, but he's at his house. He's invited all his sinner friends. It's like, no, I, my pastor says I can't have any relationships with people who are lost. Who told you that? Who lied to you? Because everywhere you go, whether it's school, whether it's your job, whether it's the grocery store, you're having conversations with people who are lost. And I know we love just to do, my dad always says this, and I agree, we do business with believers if you can, but you can't always do that. So you're gonna have conversations with people who don't know God And so these walls that you think you have set for your kids too, parents, that nothing's going to touch them and and, and it's just, we can only do so much, but these are not what we are to create. These as Christians, we're not to put these up with people who are far from God. Could you imagine the health of our next generation if every single hospital or pediatrician said we are no longer going to be taking care of sick patients? And Jesus is like, this is, This is why I'm here. All this fellowship at the table characterizes the essence of Jesus' ministry. I'm dining with sinners. And this is what he's asking us to partake in as well. Are you willing to say, you know what, at my table, the table that I sit at, the table that my family is a part of, the table that, that, that we dwell around, there is an open seat For somebody who does not know God, there is an open seat for that lost person. There's there's an open seat for for Uncle Kerry, who's, you know, he's the drunk, and he's always saying crazy things, and uh, don't dare talk politics around him, but, uh, you know, here he is. Here's a seat. And it's one thing to say, you've got a seat at this table, but it's another thing to say, you know what? All this separation just isn't going to work anymore, so so why don't we just kind of pick this up and, 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 and remove it? So I can see you, so you can see me, and so we, we can have a conversation, and I can tell you about what God has done in my life. I mean, when is the last time you got to be a part of a conversation like that? God, you've given this, this assignment to me to do as you do, and so help me have a concern and a heart for those who are far from you. Not just, I gotta show up to church, I gotta read my Bible, I gotta talk to people, I gotta fellowship, I gotta go to a small group. But if that's all we did, 
Could you imagine? You know, I'll say this, and I don't want you to take it the wrong way. I think Christians have become so heavenly minded that we have no earthly use. And you're saying, well, well, no, we've got to be heavenly minded. And we do, yes. But Jesus has given us an assignment here on this earth. We're not to be, we're in it, not to be of it. Yeah, I get it. But I'm here, and God has given me an assignment to share my faith, to help people get out of bondage, to help those who are enslaved to sin. He's called me to do that. And it's really challenging when I've got something in the way. And Jesus is like, stop building walls of separation churches, families, and start having table conversations and inviting them to be a part of what God has done in your life. And this is, this is the story of Matthew. Look what God's done. I need everybody to know. Let's throw a party, come over, and Jesus is going to be invited. Beautiful. It's going to be messy, but it'll be beautiful. It might be inconvenient, but church, it'll be so worth it. When that seed that you planted years ago, those seeds that you planted this Thanksgiving, and you hear, man, I've responded to the gospel. I'm now attending church. I read my Bible, and I'm telling everybody that I know about the man that saved my life. It'd be so worth it. I was talking to Diane Amoroso. Um, I know you just got back from Argentina. And she was like, ah, help, help. We were talking in Texan. And she was telling me about how she's been asking God to use her in her neighborhood. Has anybody you ever asked that question before? God used me in my neighborhood. I know it's like, I don't really like my neighbors uh, and they don't like me, but will you use me in some way? And so she had been praying that God would use her in her neighborhood. There was a neighbor of hers that she became friends with. Her name was Eleni. And Eleni was far from God, but was asking some questions. And so um, Diana, Diane invited her over to her house. And she said she kind of enticed her by saying, hey, I've got kittens, you know, and like you like animals, so come over and play and bring your kids and play with these kittens. And so Eleni comes over to Diane's house and immediately they jump to the table in their house and they sit down at a table and Eleni began to share all that was going on in her life and issues she was having. And Diane began to share her faith, began to share about what God had done in her life. And Eleni, in that conversation at that table, simply said, I want what you have. And it wasn't just because of what she was sharing, because not all people are just looking at what you say, but they're really looking at what you do. And one of the things that Eleni saw was her, her marriage, Diane's marriage with her husband, and said, I want that. How can I get that? Clearly, something is different about you and who you believe in. And right there at that table, Eleni gave her heart to the Lord, and Diane led her to the Lord, just like that, <laughs> sitting, at a, sitting at a table. Who knows what would happen if you invited somebody to sit at your table. I wanna challenge you with four words and then I'll pray. Four things that we can now do as we think about these table conversations that we have, as we think about not building walls of separation but building tables of connection. Four, four words, they all start with the word I. This will be real simple for you. You can put them up on the screen, Aubrey. And I want you to write these things down if you can. If you have notes, if you get your phone, just write down these four words. Number one, I want you to pray about identifying these people. Who in your life that you have a relationship with, I'm not saying the guy that you've ne never met before, that you don't even know who they are, they just, on some other side of their street, that you don't like. I'm talking about who, who do you know that is far from God? Identify those people. Write them down. Is it somebody in your family? Is it somebody in your neighborhood? And then I want you to invest in them. Now, I'm not saying give them your money or give them all your time, but invest in them. And what I mean by that is have a conversation with them. Have a genuine conversation with them. You know, people can realize and understand when you're fake and you don't really care about them. They can see that. They can look right past that. But if you invest in them, have a serious conversation, be intentional about finding some common ground. I love what Paul said in the, in the scriptures. He said, I became the Jew to win the Jew. I became the, 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 the Gentile to win the, the Gentiles. I became one of the law to win those of the law. He, he became those people. What, he, what he's saying is he, I, I'm finding common ground between those that I know. What, what was the common ground that Diane found about her neighbor, Eleni, was that she loved animals. 
and Diane just happened to be fostering some little kittens. And so there was some common ground, come over and play with the little kittens. And just like that, conversations are happening. So invest in those parents on your kids' sports teams that you never really talked to. Could you invest in them? Thirdly, and most importantly, we need you to intercede for them. Will you pray? Will you fall on your knees? And will you begin to ask that God would bring that individual to the faith? They may be so far from God, and you may be thinking, God, I do not want to spend eternity with my neighbors in heaven. Please, God. If they're so far gone, there's no hope for that person. There's no hope for them. There was no hope for you, and here you are today. Some of you were worse than them, and here you are today. So would you intercede on their behalf? Would you, would you approach the throne room of God and say, God, would you begin to work in their life? Now, here's what's happening at that point. You've, one, already identified those people. Number two, you've already invested in those people, which meant you already have some relationship with them. You already have access to them. There's a trust bond that's already forming. And now, now you're interceding, which is setting up the very last one. Put him back up there for me, Aubrey. The very last one which is for you to invite. Now you can have the conversation. I think so many, we jump to that. We jump to that conversation. I remember sitting at a a Chili's one time and with some friends and the waiter was coming up and clearly it looked like, and how she talked, she wasn't a believer. And my friend is like, do you know you, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If you died today, you'd die and go to hell. Do you know that? And this this person was like, yo, chill, I'm out of here. Give me a new, give me a new table. I mean, we jumped to the invite. Can you come to church? And there's nothing wrong with that. And we should always do that. And we've got two options for Christmas Eve uh, th- this year that you can invite people to service to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I think we jumped to that. And what's happened is, well, there's no seeds that have been planted. There's no trust that's been formed. There's no communication that's been formed. And, and you don't really know who they are. And so, so we start off with identifying them. We invest in them. We pray for them. And then, then we get to the invite. Hey, would you, would you want to come to church with me this, this, this Sunday? Or, hey, would, would you want to come over tomorrow night because my family's having a meal and I've got a whole bunch of extra seeds and I got a, a whole bunch of leftover food from Thanksgiving that, is this still good now? Can we still eat Thanksgiving food? I'm still eating Thanksgiving. Is that wrong? I'm still eating Thanksgiving food. I'm doing the whole turkey thing with mayonnaise on a sandwich. Praise God for leftover turkey and mayonnaise on a sandwich. Come on, that's, that's just the best right there. But I've got all this extra food and I've got all these seeds and I'd love for you to show up. That's my challenge for you. I want you to identify them. I want you to invest in them. I want you to intercede for them and I want you to invite them. And let's watch what God begins to do in and through you. Amen, church? Come on, would you stand to your feet? Father, we're so grateful that you've called us to be a part of this perfect plan. We don't know why you would call imperfect people to be a part of a perfect plan, but here we are. Here we are. And Lord, I only ask that you would do as you please with me. I'm your servant. We are your servants. We are your vessels. God, and I may think that it's impossible for you to use me to share my faith. God, I don't know what to say. I don't think that they'll believe me. I don't think that I'll be able to convince them. Well, let me take this off you, church. It's not your job to cause them to believe. It's not your job to convince them. That's the Spirit's job. You are to plant the seed. So, Father, I pray that there would be boldness in this room, that we would raise up a generation, a church of soul winners, God, who are bold about their faith, who are bold about forming deep relationships with those people in their neighborhood, those people in their communities, and their jobs, that we would form deep relationships with them, God, that we would pray on their behalf, that we would intercede, that they would repent of their sins, that they would come to know you and have access to the Father, because that's what you did. You took that wall of separation, where back in the day, the only way to get to you was to get through a high priest. You took that veil and you tore it when you died on that cross. And you gave us access to the Father. God, I hope everybody knows that we have access to the Father. I want my neighbors to know that they don't have to do anything great. They don't have to clean themselves up. They don't have to shape themselves up. They just have to show up. Because you told us that we are invited to sit at your table. God, I can't believe that I've been invited to sit at this table. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God, that I can be a part of this foundation that you are building. In fact, with your eyes closed and your heads bowed, I want to pray for somebody in this room, pray for somebody watching online that maybe you don't know who Jesus is and 
Maybe you've sensed this feeling inside of you. The Bible says that he knocks at your heart. He says, I have a plan for you. Just like he told Matthew, he said, all of your days have been ordained. I have a purpose for you. I have a hope for you. Would you surrender your way of living? And would you accept my way? Because it's way better. It's way better. The Bible says that if you call in his name, if you believe in your heart, that he was raised from the dead after he died on that cross, the Bible says that you will be saved, that your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that when you die, that you will, be a, you will, you will see Jesus seated high, and he will say, welcome, my child. Welcome, my good and faithful servant. If that's you, I don't want you to walk out of these doors. I don't want you to tune out online before saying, I need Jesus in my life. If that's you, let me pray this prayer. It's not this magical prayer that saves you, but it's this moment right now that you recognize that you are a sinner, and because you are a sinner, you are in need of a Savior. So would you repeat this after me? Would you say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I'm a broken person in need of a Savior. Save me, God. Change me. From now on, I want to live for you. Show me how to do that. Teach me how to do that. Today, I am your child, and you are my father. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen.